if you're joining us, uh, make sure that you're uh, muted at the beginning. And then if we get into the conversation portion, we'll, we'll kind of ask you to unmute or unmute as we go. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Tom Callen, NEO, uh, with my colleague Jordan Adams. This is the 233rd anniversary of the signing, not the ratification, of the signing of the U.S. Constitution in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We tend to honor Constitution Day every year here at NEO. I think technically it was a requirement that was sneaked into a bill by the late Senator Robert Byrd of West Virginia but we carry forth here at NEO. Our guest this year is Grove Police Chief Mark Morris, and the issue is probably the second major story of the year in the United States. We all know that the coronavirus is without doubt the lead story, but also there's the issue of equal justice under the law, the U.S. Constitution, and policing, which has become even more of a fervent issue since the uh, tragedy of the death of uh, George Floyd on May 25th in Minneapolis. So thank you for everybody for joining. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief Mark Morris, for being here. Any questions before we start? I have a question, sort of. It's not really a question, it's a comment, but Joshua Davis is with me. And Just so you have him for attendance. Okay. Okay. We normally have our normal American government class at this hour, but today we're in a, in a different format in which I'm trying to moderate a discussion. Uh, one question to Police Chief Mark Morris, how did we get to the point in the country where two sheriff's deputies were shot at over the weekend in Los Angeles? And we actually had people outside the hospital cheering. Of, I mean, an extreme minority, but you're probably aware of that story. What are some of your thoughts and where we stand here between um, local minority communities and policing? Go well, I would get. I'm sorry. I'm guess. I'm guessing if I could answer that question, then. I would, uh, I'd have a much higher paying job. I, I don't know how we got to where we're at. I think there, I, I will tell you my theory, uh, a little bit of what I think fed into it. Um, so our department, much like departments around the nation, when uh, the virus hit, I issued a directive to our staff here that said, hey, um, let's use great, dis great discretion in making traffic stops, making arrests, the, jo the jails have shut down. They weren't allowing people into the jail. And I, I think that played into opening Pandora's box to a degree. Um, gave um, some the sense of um, enforcement's uh, backed off. And so now we're not, uh, we're, we're more free to to do things that we want to do or, or do things without much um, concern of, of uh, legal ramifications. I think that played into part of it. I'm not saying that's the whole, uh, the whole uh, thing that led to that. And I think there's been a, uh, a, a bit of um, tension and, and I'm going to say from my experience, since we live in a largely, um, our, our community here is not as diverse as many across the nation. So I don't have a lot of insight into a lot of the inner cities and how they deal with things. Um, but I do think uh, for some time there's been uh, poverty plays into it. Um, people believe they're oppressed, whether they are not. So if, if my grandfather told me at, that I was oppressed and my dad taught me I was oppressed, does it, is that, that's the reality, whether or not it's true or not. Now, I have to say, in the month of May, one day I just started counting the number of times I heard the following adjective. And I bet you know what I'm going to say. Systemic. The word systemic popped up on every single national broadcast, in the newspapers. And I told my wife, 
uh, this is becoming the new catchword. The members, there were uh, white Americans, black Americans, and others, and there were people even in uh, police departments where the chief is African American and the mayor is African American, who said that the police departments display, quote, systemic racism. I know that our community here doesn't reflect the diversity you might find in South Minneapolis. How do you respond to that charge? Is that fair or not? I don't think it's fair at all. And I will tell you from my experience, um, and, I, and I will tell you this, I've, I've interacted and I've met police officers from all over the United States and all over the world. I actually have a, a friend that's an inspector in Dublin, Ireland. I've met uh, police officers from um, China. I've met them from Japan. I've yet to meet one, and I'm not telling you that it doesn't exist because I believe it does, but I've yet to meet one that uh, first of all, woke up every morning or went to work every morning and said, man, I can't wait to go out and shoot someone. Not met that, that police officer, have not met him. Because the, um, to a great degree, that's the last thing that the police officers I know want to do. There's so much that follows that. First of all, uh, we, we, ha we hold human life in great regard. Secondly, uh, if you're involved in that kind of a situation, uh, that's, that's a career ruiner. You have to live with that situation, the tragedy of that. Not only do you have to live with the tragedy of uh, using deadly force, but you also have to go through the process, which is um, you, you're going to be sued. Uh, you may face criminal charges. So when we talk about, um, I know from my perspective and what I see, when we answer a call, whether that's a domestic disturbance, an assault, a traffic stop, we don't see color. I don't. I don't know people that do see color. I'll give you an example. I, I read a, a, a something here a while back. It said um, a black man couldn't drive through Oklahoma City in a BMW without getting stopped, but a white person could. Um, likely, that officer for speeding, for instance, that officer is not even going to see that driver until that that uh, speed shows up on his radar. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's an unfair analogy when those statements are made. My perspective, uh, I don't believe we see color when we deal with issues uh, in regards to answering a call or enforcing the law. If I may interject a little bit, <clears throat> uh, I wanted to... Um kind of respond a little bit to what Tom was saying um, when he was um, talking about the term systemic. We've had a few conversations about this before. Um, and, and uh, you know, what, uh, what Chief Morris was saying um, is that the realities of, of the, the job uh, can be um, certainly more nuanced than we get um, the impression of. Um, one, one point that I wanted to make as a counterpoint is um, that when we talk about uh, race as it relates to, you know, traffic stops and, and um, um, law enforcement deaths, um, one of the, a, uh, a study that I have from 2016 was showing that um, uh, how, where, the cases, where the cases are um, related, uh, black victims um, uh, of, of law enforcement death um, while they were a majority, or so while we have a majority of white victims in, in uh, law enforcement deaths at 52%, um, they are disproportionately black uh, nationwide. Um, so you have 32% of the deaths. And then in terms of demography, you would assume that you have about, um, uh, so let me see, we have a 76% of the United States is white while 13% is black. Um, and so the point that um, I think that that might get uh, lost here sometimes is uh, the nationwide statistical outline is a lot different than, um, you know, case by case in departments around the country. Um, so in, in the case of, you know, Grove or Oklahoma City, you might have um, a different situation than you would have in, in Minneapolis or or Alabama or something like that. So, um, you know, that's just a point that I wanted to kind of uh, make there how, uh, you know, sometimes it can be a little bit more nuanced than, uh, than either social media or, or media gives it credit for.
So, oh, and, and I don't disagree with you. And let me go back and say, I, I believe that racism, uh, I, I believe does exist and I believe it exists within police departments. I've not met those, per those people. Um, the other thing I would tell you, if you kind of look at this from a different angle and you'd look at Ferguson and their demographics, uh, what I've often wondered, disproportionately in Grove, Oklahoma, probably Miami, Oklahoma, uh, and a lot of communities, this, if you look at our numbers, are we um, prejudiced towards whites? Or are we prejudiced towards American Indians? Those are our demographics. So if you look at our numbers, it looks, it would look like on the surface that uh, we're prejudiced towards uh, Caucasians, right? because our numbers is, are going to reflect the majority of the people we deal with are white with a very small percentage of other races. I mean, does, do you understand that point? So if you look at Ferguson where those demographics are different, uh, the majority of the people who live in Ferguson, as I remember, you can correct me if I'm wrong, were, uh, were black. So their numbers are going to reflect that in traffic stops and arrest and so on. Whether it was in, I teach a, a few speech classes in addition to American government. And the other day, um, one of the, one of the students, African American, said she wanted to give an extemporaneous speech on Black Lives Matter. That got everyone's attention it was quite apparent to me that there was a divergence of opinion. I hate to say it. If I inter with the African-American students, they felt the police had a bias against blacks. The white students, and particularly the white male students, vociferously disagreed. And even a few years ago in an American government class, I had some trouble getting some of the African-American students participating. But when the issue of North Tulsa came up, they all had a story to tell. They all felt there was a bias on the part of the police against the African-American community. The whites in the class disagreed. Um, how do you go about changing that perception? And does the media reinforce uh, perceptions to begin with? Let me mention one thing. I shouldn't ask a question and then keep on speaking. So I'm violating good journalistic ethics. When you get back to Minneapolis, you recall the Sunday before that event, there was a white woman in Central Park. She was walking a dog. There was an African American who, I don't know if he was an ornithologist, but he was interested in observing birds. He told her, look at the sign, leash your dog. Her immediate response was to call 911 and claim that a black man was trying to harm her. The next day you get Minneapolis, really a, a one-two punch to the American psyche. How do you go about changing that perception in, in the African-American community? Let me, let me pause. I, I think another way to look at that question is to um, <clears throat> kind of ask where the perception needs changing. Um, does does it need change, and and from what angle? Um, in what way does um, you know white society need to change its perceptions of um, black society? And what ways does black society need to change its perception of, of white society? And um, is the the example you gave about the the students in North Tulsa? Um, it is uh, you know practicing empathy. Um, what what you perceive another person's situation to be might not be what that person perceives their own situation to be. Yeah, and absolutely. And I think regardless, and again, I would say this, regardless of um, reality, that is their perception. Um, not saying that there is, uh, there is some reality in that, I'm sure. So um, the media absolutely, in my opinion, plays a huge part in that. Uh, drives that uh, drives that issue one way or another, uh, but you look at it in rural Oklahoma, and 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 I'll give you this example as well. Um, 
I know a family, generational uh, families that have interacted with law enforcement, not in a positive way for generations, for generations. So what is their perception every time a sheriff's deputy or a police car pulls into their driveway? That's a negative interaction, right? So, uh, and so I equate that to what I believe uh, goes to that issue is, you know, society um, has rules and this family for the most part are breaking those laws and breaking those societal rules. So the greater question is, I think moving forward, what do we want as society? And uh, Mr. Cowan, I'm sure you're familiar with Sir Robert Peel and, the, and his principles of law enforcement. And one of those principles were are uh, the police are the people and the people are the police. And in essence, that says that the people decide what the police do. What do you want as, uh, what do you want for your law enforcement? So when we look at drugs are a big issue and I, I actually met with a Senator three years ago now and said he asked about putting people in prison for drugs. I said, I think it's a bad idea. I don't think it helps. I, I, I don't see putting a, a, someone that is addicted to drugs in prison. I don't think that's helpful to society. We need to find a different path to deal with that problem and not fill our prisons with that problem. So as you've seen things move forward, uh, marijuana laws have changed. Um, Actually, marijuana laws and other laws uh, that pertain to thefts and pertain to um, uh, auto burglaries and those kind of things, those bars have been raised and, and the penalties have been lowered. So it, it, it comes down to a societal issue. What are we willing or what do we want as a society to, uh, our, for our police to enforce? And I bring up drugs because you hear a lot in the news that that was those laws were focused on the black community to oppress the black community. The drug laws and 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 so yeah. what, what do we want as a community, what do we want as a society. I don't know if that answered your question, I will say the media plays a huge part in that and turns the tide one way or the other. As to the perception of the public. Where did this concept of systemic come? You know, I have to do some research. Did I say that word exploded? Would you agree with me that it exploded in the month of May? Absolutely. So I would ask this question, and and I would love it. Uh, I would love to get feedback on this. Yes. So, so put your put yourself as a police. Uh, put yourself in the shoes of a police officer. And let's have, uh, let's have you sitting in a car and you engaging into uh, an individual who has just committed a crime and you, you give this person orders to uh, the need to comply with or you want them to comply with and those persons, that person refuses to comply with those orders. Then we have the es escalation. What I would be interested to know is if I give you, if you committed an armed robbery and you come outside the store and you have a gun in your head and I give you an order to drop the gun and get on the ground and you don't comply with that order, what, what would you all expect for law enforcement to do to handle that situation? I would, I, 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 I'm, sincerely would be interested in knowing what those other options are. I'm open to other options. The defunding police came about and initially I was somewhat taken back and, and um, almost offended by that. But when you start digging down into that, I agree with some of that. We deal with uh, mentally ill patients almost on a daily basis. I'm not sure that is the role or should be the role of law enforcement. And, uh, and this particular uh, issue is a lot of where our problems come into play with in terms of uh, force or deadly force. So you're faced with that situation. You're the police officer. I would, I would be open to hear ideas of how we make that better, how we reduce 
the um, the interaction of or the uh, introduction of force into that situation, in, including deadly force. Now, I'm sure you remember mid-June in Atlanta, Georgia. Somebody, a black man, walks out of a Wendy's, which is later burned to the ground. And I don't think it's because they didn't like the burgers inside. So the man's on the outside. Um, a white officer asks him some questions. And I'm trying to reconstruct this as carefully as I can. Suddenly, the officer arrests the African-American. I'm not clear what the violation was. There's a, there's a scuffle in the parking lot, I guess, adjacent to the Wendy's. The African-American then starts to run away, turns to the officer with a taser. He, he took the officer's taser. He points it at the officer. He runs. The video suggests that the person running had his back turned and was then shot. Wendy's is then burned to the ground. Did that, and I realize that these videos don't always communicate reality either. As a former reporter, I could see that when you bring the, the cameras back to the newsroom. But the perception came again, this was the second time in a couple of weeks that there seemed to be unjust force. How do you respond to that? Well, I mean, I, and again, I would ask people, first of all, there is a, a, a process in place um, whenever there's a deadly force incident conducted by a law enforcement officer. And that process is, to, it's going to be looked at by, uh, in our case, would be looked at by the Oklahoma Bureau of Investigation. Uh, it's not a pleasant process. So you're going to go through and you're going to get all the facts. You're going to get it, not all, you're going to get the big picture. You're going to try to get as many facts into that as possible. So you asked me that question. I'm not there. I, I, I wasn't part of that situation. I didn't investigate that situation. And so I can't give you a, a good answer. What I would tell you is uh, that use of force would need to be reviewed. And if those officers um, had other ways or uh, a, a better way to deal with that situation, then that should come out within that investigation. Again, I would ask people when they look at those kind of situations to put themselves in the shoes of the police officer and say, hey, would, would I be willing to stand there and be, be tased? And then uh, with that exposing, rendering me uh, unable to defend myself and also having a firearm on my side that then could be taken and used against me. So I, I haven't looked at the stats recently, but for quite a while, number one cause of death, gunshot uh, with a firearm used on a police officer was his own firearm. So maybe through training starting at the academy and uh, through, through an officer's career, we look at those kind of things and what, it, what would make it better. But I would love insight into that because if you're pointing a taser at me, if you're coming at me with a knife, if you're coming at me with a baseball bat, I would love to hear other options other than deadly force. What can law enforcement use in those situations? That situation you're talking about, Mr. Cowan, under Oklahoma, as I understand it, under Oklahoma law, under our use of force continuum, uh, would justify, just in the snippet that we know about, uh, in a general speaking term, would have justified the use of deadly force. Now, students, please speak up. Ask questions. Otherwise, we just got two or three of us communicating with each other. Uh, I, I see Barbara Turkle, Bobby Bizanar, Riley Cisneros. I, I do have um, like some sort of insight. Uh, with racism, it is really easy to cover one side of the story because um, the shooting that just happened, um, I forgot exactly where it was, where the kid, the 17 year old had the AR and you know, it was covered that he shot uh, well, that they were abusing him, and then he shot the three people. Well, the media covered left side and right side of it. So um, on Twitter, I have a lot of people who are like um, either really for this kid or really against this kid because 
they're saying, why did he show up in the first place with an AR-14? I think that's what he had. Um, AK-47, whatever. Um, and then other people like, well, you know, maybe he antagonized them. That's why they were abusing him. Because I, I saw someone who said um, previously, like two blocks away, someone, um, he shot and killed someone. And so that's why they were abusing him. But then there's other people like, no, he killed them and, you know, at, or he abused him. So that's why he killed him. So I think the media has definitely influenced so many people to believe that the whole system, I don't know if you've heard of this, the ACAB, all cops are um, bastards. Well, that is very big on Twitter. Um, and then there's people who are like, that is disgraceful and, you know, like I said, there's, especially in Gen Z and millennials, um, there is a lot of confusion going around because of media covering half of the story or only showing what people want to see, the left or the right side. So um, I, I feel like that is definitely something that messes up, you know, people in unity with the cops and with, um, you know, just people in general, racism, all of that is just, it boggles my mind. I, I can't explain it, but what do, what do you feel about that? You're asking Chief Morris, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah, that, absolutely. And we had an incident just recently, not in our community, but in a neighboring community, uh, where it was a deadly force. So I think what we're talking about is misinformation um uh from one side or the other so it, it i think it's it's just a lot of misinformation so we had a uh a deadly force uh issue in a community neighboring us and uh the the person was um american indian was the victim and so immediately uh came out that it was he was shot because he was native american what they didn't realize was the chief of police in this community is um, full blood Cherokee Indian and also sits on the tribal council. So, I mean, there's just a lot of, a lot of misinformation and a lot of, um, and that's unfortunate that that's out there because I think we all would like the reality of what happened. One of the biggest, and and I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but one of the biggest complaints I get within interdepartmental here is no matter what the complaint is that comes in, I investigate it. No, I mean, if you got stopped and you said the officer was rude and you called me, I'm going to pull all the tape. I'm going to listen to that traffic stop and I'm going to look into that. And I don't think that's uncommon for police administrations to do that. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but the media absolutely plays a huge part in the perception of um, that that people get, good or bad. And right now the buzz is racism, right? Systemic racism. Don't know where that came from. Don't know how that rose to be where it is today. And not saying that in some cases that's not justified because uh, it probably is in certain areas. One perception I have is that people have trouble defining racism and distinct between bigotry versus racism. Racism traditionally means that you think that someone's racial attributes are their main characteristic. That, in other words, I'm, 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 I'm what? Irish American. That being Irish American is the main characteristic that defines my personality. I don't think it is. Whereas someone who's a bigot is gonna say, well, He's Irish, get him out of here. I mean, just he's Irish, he's no good. Um, but I know the word racism is tossed around without any definition. And do not ask me how to solve some of these problems because you know what the answer is, the attrition of time. And I, I think one problem people had is everyone was under the assumption that a lot of things we're discussing were discussed uh, in the 1960s. I was struck one day on TV, they were interviewing a young lady marching in New York City. She says, we need laws to deal with uh, racial discrimination. 
She had no idea that there was the 1964 Civil Rights Law, the um, Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Fair Housing Act of 1968. She didn't know any of these things existed. <laughs> so I thought, but she was probably too young to be aware. All right. All right, Riley, thank you. Uh, how about Barbara Turkle? Barbara, I'm gonna ask you a question. I'll tell you why I'm doing it. Barbara is a student of ours from Croatia. Can you hear me, Barbara? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, so you're from overseas. Give us a foreign perspective on the type of discussion you're hearing here. Please go. Um, here's a uh, really everything different for me. And in my country, we don't have like that much black people. So basically we don't have racism uh, that much in point like we, I have, like I see here in America. And um, in this college, like I saw also like some, like some, I don't know, uh, uh, other perspectives and everything um, about these black and white people, but also like just to go out. Go I'm in far. my room. Okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, it's really different and um, it's hard to watch these videos and everything, but I also agree that um, every video, every video has like a different uh, site, like to see uh, maybe about this Jacob Blake. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it may be uh, she, like he couldn't like take maybe these seven shots. But we don't have like we don't know uh, the other side of story. I mean, I I read on the internet that he he was like abusing uh, some why uh, some woman and everything. So I don't know what to believe. Like right, but like in generally, I don't know. It's really different from Croatia and here. I mean, in uh, generally in Europe, like it has like really a much of racism. I have like my friends from Belgium and France and everything, and it really is. And there is also like in every country in the world, racism is existing. And but here in America, it's really like so bigger, like uh, stuff and everything. Mm. I want to take a moment to uh, you know point out that uh, kind of follow up on something that uh, Mr. Callum was saying. He was talking about um, racism as you know uh, as its identifying characteristics. I think one of the things that um, we don't often focus on is someone doesn't necessarily have to be racist to be prejudiced, right? Um, so having um, you know, preconceived notions, whether it's poverty, whether it's race, whether it's um, sex, uh, there are um, prejudices that certainly kind of build, build people's worldviews, whether those are positive or negative. Um, <clears throat> and another, uh, I, I just wanted to kind of clarify that to, to speak to um, Chief Morris's point and kind of the question that uh, Mr. Callum was saying is, um, you know, uh, Chief Morse was talking about uh, what, what do you do? What, what is your thought um, if you're in a, a deadly force situation? Um, and I think one of the, the questions that and you, when we cover these things, when things are covered on the media, when we discuss them, it's always the end result. Um, it's always the use of deadly force. And I think one of the things that people are trying to shift the focus to is how do you prevent the escalation in the first place? Um, how do uh, you enter into a situation to make it safe for police officers, but also safe for somebody? Because um, one of the issues that people have is you have these um, minor offenses. Um, you know, uh, in the case of George Floyd, I think it was the use of a counterfeit twenty-dollar bill. Um, this is a this is a minor thing that you know you you ask any police officer in the United States, and most of them are going to say, uh, "No, that's not a that's not an offense that would." that should result in death. Um, and so it's trying to find ways um, to uh, enter into situations that, that prevent that escalation to the point of the use of deadly force. And one of the things that, um, you know, I have, a, I have a friend of mine who's on the uh, Bentonville police force. Um, and one of the things that they discuss a lot is the, the um, idea of community policing or having police um, who reflect the community they're in. So Chief Morris, if you would just kind of give us an overview of 
kind of how community policing works and kind of what what steps that you guys in Grove take uh, to try to build that that relationship and that community between uh, yourself and the people that you're policing. Sure, and I, I want to go back to your your uh, statement on George Floyd, and I don't know how much you've researched that, but let me give you a little different perspective uh, into that situation. Yes, the call was on a counterfeit twenty dollar bill, and I think we all agree that that someone passing a counterfeit twenty dollar bill would not uh, and should not result in the use of deadly force. I would encourage you to listen to um, the people that called nine one one on George Floyd why he was at the place of business and the, hear the fear in their voices, your, our citizens calling the police for help. So I would encourage, if you haven't researched that, look deeper into that because it, in essence, it wasn't about a counterfeit $20 bill. Again, tragic incident, he should have never lost his life. Uh, when it comes to community policing, we have, um, we have a citizens academy once a year. We have a youth academy. Uh, love being part of that. One of the things we do in that is part of the uh, topic that we're talking about today is we bring in a system called the Milo system. And it's like a big video game. You stand in front of these big screens and you're faced with decision making. And those decisions are to use force. Do you use uh, intermediate force? Do you use deadly force? Do you not use any force at all? And I think it becomes a real eye opener for those people that have not ever been in that situation. So uh, you're faced with a guy that is um, coming at you with a knife. And at what point do you and how close do you let him get to you? And he may end up dropping the knife if you keep talking to him. So uh, and then back to your other statement when you talk about where where the issue begins and then it evolves into a deadly force situation and like I mentioned earlier and we're in discussions now I'm very uh, interested in a triage 911 system they use in Oregon where if someone is having a, a mental health issue but doesn't meet the requirement our requirements uh, to take those people into custody and our by uh, the information coming in is not um, is not a danger to uh, the police, not a danger to themselves, then they triage those type of calls to mental health workers instead of putting the police in that situation, which sometimes, as we all are aware, uh, increases or can increase the volatility of those situations. So I'm very interested in that. Um, now, what happens a lot of times is, is that those mental health first responders get on scene and that situation uh, digresses in a hurry. And so law enforcement has to be called in. I'll share with you an issue and the courts have been over the last couple of years, our, our profession's changing a lot. We had a guy uh, self barricaded into a, a garage apartment, had a handgun, um, threatening suicide uh, he had an elderly mom and dad in the house. We moved them from the house and based on recent court decisions and based on um, speaking about the situation with our district attorney, we pack up and leave. That's, that's not, that's, that's unusual. Uh, it's not what we're built to do is not, but our mere presence in this situation can escalate that situation. It was terribly hard for us to do that. So the only person then at that time, we tried to get him to talk to, to mental health professionals. He refused to do that. The only person in danger at that time was that individual himself. Now, had we deployed tactics like we would have in the past, which may be <laughs> it's hot cutting the power to the house and letting it get hot in the apartment, uh, deploy chemical munitions to have him come out, all of those things have the potential for him to kill himself or for uh, the police, for him to face the police in a deadly force situation arise out of that. Now, it sounds pretty simple when I talk about that. We just leave and actually it worked out pretty good. But while I was there on the scene, I looked across the street and, and uh, there was a lady probably in her 90s that came over her house to see what was going on. So the issue I have, uh, part of the issue I have with that, and this guy was having um, um, 
he was hallucinating and having all kinds of issues. So, and I'm not saying this to be funny or, or to uh, belittle this individual, but my thought in my head is what if he comes out of the house, he has this gun, he looks at his 90 year old neighbor across the street and to him all the, all of a sudden she's become an alien that's landed across the street. Now we've walked away from this and we're not protecting that individual from this guy. Mm. It's a tough situation. But at the end of the day, we walked away from it. Um, it, it that particular uh, situation worked out. It, he ended up uh, uh, handing the gun over later to his mom once things cooled off. So there's a lot more, um, a lot more uh, thought going into those processes, which I think, again, I think that's a good thing. I think we evaluate those. We, uh, you know, I've been in the business for a long time. 20 years ago, we'd have been there five minutes, busted the door down, and whatever happened, happened. Those kind of things are changing. So. I hope that answered your question. Well, clearly across the United States, starting here in Delaware County, we have drug courts, right, in Delaware County. Uh, in the south side of Chicago, I made a list of all the different organizations working to reduce gun violence. Uh, you have African-American police officers in the south side of Chicago, yet you still have gangs that nobody can control who are often murdering kids who are literally three or six years of age. And it's sometimes you think, boy, as a society, there's so many different groups trying to help a situation, yet we still have tragic outcomes all the time. Um, and so that's when you almost want to sit back and reflect because wherever you live in the United States, there are people who are actively involved to try to help communities deal with strife and conflict. And sometimes I'm at a pains to suggest what else can be done. I want to point out, and if somebody else wants to speak, please go ahead. You know, I'm a former broadcaster, so the, the, our big sin is we don't want to have any dead air time. I mean, <laughs> but uh, I remember the Watts riots in Los Angeles of August 1965. There is a situation where there was tension between the police department and what was the primarily African-American community in Watts. It's, now it's primarily Hispanic. A white officer shows up. Mrs. Fry felt that Mrs. Fry is African-American. She felt her son was drinking. She chases her son outside and reprimands him. A crowd gathers. The officer shows up. I think she slaps the officer. Society collapses. Over 36 people are dead and that part of Los Angeles burned to the ground. That just shows you how a situation that seems mundane, prosaic and ordinary can madly spin out of control. I wish we had interviews, and I think Mark would say no, with uh, Officer Chauvin up in Minneapolis. Um, he had no way of knowing that his actions that day would create a mammoth international news story. Well, I'm sure a lot would disagree with me, and, I, and, and we're talking about that situation, and, and what I would offer in that situation as well, I don't believe that was a, a race-based situation. When I look at that, I think this officer would have acted that way regardless whether that individual, George Floyd, would have been black, white, Hispanic. I don't think race played a part in the way this officer dealt with that situation. Um, don't think he dealt with the situation correctly. Although I would tell you, and I haven't, I haven't taken time, but as I understand, uh, the officer was probably not outside of policy uh, when he dealt with him the way he did, N not the way I, I would like myself or any of our officers to deal with that situation. Reviewing policies, we're, 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 in, a, 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 we're in a phase right now within our department where we're, we're reviewing all of our policies and that particular incident came up and there's a policy, uh, cardiovascular neck restraint policy that we have. Um, and, and so in order to use that technique, you have to be trained in it. And there's a laundry list of issues. 
that you have to go through to, to be able to uh, use that tactic. Um, my concern is if I get into a physical altercation with someone, I'm going to try to take them to the ground to get them to where we can control them and get them handcuffed. I'm not, if I'm not trained in cardiovascular restraint, but my hand happens to go around their neck as I'm trying to take them to the ground to get them, get them handcuffed. I have violated that policy and you see how that opens the door. Yeah. So would you get into those confrontations? And that's why I like citizens police academies because we actually have, uh, we put up, we, we have mock traffic stops. We have mock domestic disturbances, um, mock crime scene investigation, but we put those students uh, in a controlled environment in situations that we see and we get to watch them and how they react. And then we get to ask them questions. What would you have done as the officer to make this better? Because in reality, once you're there, it is a whole lot different than watching it on the six o'clock news. And to kind of follow up with, you know, what you were saying and, and tie that into community policing, I think that's one of the reasons why um, it's really important that the police who are protecting a community are, are engaged with that community. Um, if you have uh, someone who's perceived to be an outsider coming into a situation, um, then it might escalate tensions between the community and, and the officer involved. Uh, but if you have officers who um, are engaged with the community, are at community functions and, and you know, uh, perceived as, um, you know, changing that perception again to being a, a, this person is here to protect me and my family and my community members. Um, and, and one of the thing you, things you mentioned, Chief Morris, was, um, you know, the, the discussion uh, or the more, more nuanced discussion around defund the police, where, um, you know, at first glance, uh, that comes across as, well, cut all the police's funding, um, where, if you dig into that, it's it's a discussion of what should the police do. Um, what is is it uh, appropriate to have a police officer respond to a situation that a mental health care worker might be more um, apt to respond to? Is it appropriate to have the only interaction that people have with their police officers as uh, getting a speeding ticket? Um, that doesn't build a lot of trust if the only time that you interact with a police officer is getting pulled over. Um, so what, what ways can we kind of take some of those responsibilities off the shoulders of police officers, um, shift them around to either mental health care workers um, or, uh, you know, community partners or, or something else, and then allow those officers to build those community ties uh, to try to, um, create kind of more cooperation between the community. I think that some of the community policing studies have shown that when you have police officers engaged in a community and, and where uh, an individual feels comfortable calling a police officer, if, you know, if you have a drug situation where it's like, oh, well, I saw that somebody's, you know, dealing drugs, um, you know, two blocks over, they're more likely to contact the, the police officers and say, hey, you know, I saw you at the the bake sale, uh, you know, last weekend, and I wanted to reach out and say, this is what I think is happening. Uh, and that kind of community effort to improve the community rather than a, a crime and punishment only focus. And, and I don't disagree with that. The other thing I would tell you, especially with young policemen, um, policemen, especially young policemen, interact with other policemen. So that culture and, and that, since I've been in for, I've been, I'll be with Grove for 33 years on November 1st. Mm -hmm. that, that culture hasn't changed. Uh, although even years ago when I was in the academy, they encouraged policemen, don't just be friends with other policemen, be friends with a, a professor at NEO, be friends with a doctor, be friends with a minister. But so it's a matter, it becomes a matter of trust. So you talk about the thin blue line, which has become a nasty word. But policemen um, know that that guy that they're out there working with has got his back no matter what. So if he gets in a bad situation, he knows his partner's got him. 
And then it almost becomes a, an environment where I can't talk to anyone else because nobody else understands because they're not in that squad car with me. They're not dealing with these situations. No one else understands me. And when I do talk about it uh, to the normal citizen, they look at me like I'm, I'm uh, an evil person because this is what took place. So then the only person I can talk to is another policeman. That culture has to and needs to change. And that goes to community policing. Uh, and of course, you're dealing with individual personalities in police department, no different than any other profession. I have guys here that are absolutely great. They go out and do uh, neighborhood watch programs and different events. I have two school resource officers that talk to kids every single day. They do a great job and they have a great relationship with the kids in school. And then I have other officers that don't want to interact with anybody, but it's a personality thing. So I don't disagree with you at all. The, um, the other side of that is, and I can tell you from being a police officer, are you my friend because you like me and I'm a nice guy? Or are you my friend because if you get stopped, you think you're going to get out of a ticket? We look at that. I have a lot of people that cons cons I consider friends. They consider me friends. And then I, I, I get told, hey, I got stopped the other night and I told them I knew you. And I said, don't, don't do that because as a patrolman, my perspective as a patrolman, if you, if I stopped you and you said, Hey, I'm, I'm good friends with the chief. If you weren't going to get a ticket before, you're probably going to get one then. Because like all of us, those officers don't like that thrown in. I'm out here to do my job. I'm out here trying to do the right thing. And I don't need you to throw that in my face. And so, um, so that the whole culture of that has to change. Well, that's a problem of people dealing with favors. I think as a, if you're a teacher, we may have been in situations where uh, at a certain school, maybe a coach comes to you and says, you know, I'm not, not telling you how to grade the test, but I know you, you want them to graduate, don't you? Like, let's see, what, what's being communicated? Okay. But that would happen anywhere. No, I, I don't disagree with that. But, but yeah. I also think when we talk about community policing, that is a factor. So, uh, Tom, you and I are friends, and if you get stopped, that doesn't mean you're not going to get a ticket. I've not ever fixed a ticket in my career, nor would I, because I think it opens a Pandora's box. Uh, and I've lost some people that I considered friends because of that. Well, I thought we were friends. Why didn't you take care of this for me? Well, I'll give you the number to the prosecutor. You can talk to him. I once, once that officer signs the ticket, unless there's policy violations, I'm out of it. I, I, it, it's going to move forward. But, so I, I don't know if that makes any sense or you understand the dynamics that so you, you meet oh, sure. people and become friends and, and then to a degree, sometimes they expect favoritism because of that. And I think that closes the policeman off to a degree. And that probably puts pressure on people in the legal community or district attorneys because uh, somebody might expect a favor. And of course, that's a complete misuse of uh, the system which would potentially destroy someone's career. I see a lot of stories like that when I check the Chicago sometimes in Chicago. <laughs> and Chief Morris, just to kind of uh, follow up on the, the first point that you made there, um, you were talking about um, a lot of your younger officers f are friends with other officers. Um, and it's that sense of fraternity. It's a sense of camaraderie. Um, and I think that that just is is kind of in line with the broader culture of echo chambers uh, that we're we're kind of creating for ourselves, all of us, um, especially with social media. Uh, you can follow who you want to follow. You can unfollow who you don't want to hear from. And what happens is, is your social media feed then uh, is tailored to you and you're only hearing opinions that are reinforcing your own opinion. Um, and I think that's um, kind of the same thing that Chief Morris was talking about, where it kind of speaks to the need for a diversity of opinions. Um, when, uh, when you don't, when you're meeting with people or interacting with people in all different walks of life, all different backgrounds, all different socioeconomic levels, it kind of gives you a broader understanding of, you know, uh, what a certain situation is or, or how to use a lens uh, to view a different situation. 
I would agree with that. The issue of getting uh, uh, honest, straight news reporting and knowing where to go to find that. So that where do you where do you find that, Mr. Callan? I'll tell you. I, I, I'll tell you what I do when I get up in the morning. The first thing I look at on my phone is the New York Times. The second thing is Politico. The third thing is the Tulsa World. Now I get the Wall Street Journal. So it seems to me if you read the editorial page, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, they have nothing in common. You get two very different outlooks. You should then be able to form your own opinion. Uh, I, I, I do have an extensive background in the news media. And so I rely on certain publications to give me the news, whether it's out of Belarus or out of the talks on the future of Ireland as Britain prepares to have a trade deal of some sort with the European Union. So we need straight news reporting. So if we're just going to Facebook or um, some social media aspects, uh, that's fine. But you know, I've got the same people on Facebook still talking about Hillary Clinton. I'm thinking, okay, let's move on. And I think well, one I think one thing to to highlight there with what Tom was saying is that you need to look at um, why the report why a news organization is reporting news to you. What's the goal? Um, is the goal to um, create a sensational headline to get clicks and make and sell ad ad revenue, um, or um, is it something you know like the Associated Press that is trying to report straight facts? But well, remember, TV news has to have an audience. It has to hold your attention. That means certain stories may not get covered because the worst thing in TV news from the perspective of the stations is if I bore you, if I have fewer people tuning in, I'm able to charge less money to those uh, like the Grover Auto Dealership, which advertises nonstop on all Tulsa TV. So in the business of broadcasting, as Edward R. Murrell said, you've got straight news competing with showmanship, competing with advertising dollars, and that means some stories will not get covered because the news director and the management fears you will tune out. I remember once as a reporter for a station in Richmond, Virginia, I was criticized by the, the news director who said, your story is too much about process not about people. I was doing a story on the budget. I was all excited. He thought the viewers might find it dull. So there is that tension with electronic journalism. The whole idea of the internet was to have a diversity of opinions, but somehow it's quite clear we're balkanizing ourselves or segregating ourselves. So that's do, the whole, you know, that's all, that ought to be next year's topic. Do you uh, think that, um... In, in kind of going back, do you think that like like this group, and I I would find it interesting, um, with with myself or other law enforcement agencies setting down, I would love to interact with everybody in here and get their opinions, and have that go both ways. So, you know, I ask those questions. What would you do uh, if you're faced with these things? I would I absolutely would love to hear those opinions, and and based on my experience could could then relay whether that was uh, whether that was a possibility or not. I think that's a that would go a long ways in healing some divides between law enforcement and and people in the uh, in the public. Let's talk about let's sit down and talk about what options are out there and, and what we'd like to see moving forward. That open communication. Um, sometimes again, it's misunderstanding. Sometimes it's brought on by uh, misleading news stories, uh, a number of things, things on, on Facebook. Uh, let's sit down and have a conversation, a real conversation about what the problems are, how we perceive them and how we can make those problems better. Well, one uh, aspect of policing is that we can sit here on Zoom or in seminars all day long. Um, this is a non-threatening environment. You have to make split second decisions. Uh, when you talk about bringing the mental health people, what do you do if someone has a gun they have mental problems, but they're threatening to shoot. So you can't just have the mental health people. Who decides this within seconds? And in the news business, I'll tell you, the clock rules everything. And if I don't go on the air, particularly in radio news, 
with a report and I say, well, we don't have enough information, uh, I'm going to lose respect with the news director in the newsroom. I have to fill that time no matter what. So we're all dealing with the clock. And, and the issue and in, in, in having those <laughs> discussions with the mental health professionals, I, I think we're going to have a hard time finding those mental health professionals that are, that are going to be willing to go to those scenes. That's part of the issue. They don't want to show up at somebody's doorstep that's in a mental health crisis because it's, it's not a safe thing, situation. Right. Well, okay. It's now 2 a.m. in the morning. There's somebody with a mental problem. They're firing out shots. Um, and maybe they're not trying to kill anybody, but how are you going to get up a, a mental health professional to get to the scene in time? It's just not realistic. It's, so we have to, I'm in the academic world. This sounds good. But in the real world here and making the logistics work, it's almost impossible. And there's some test models out there. I think um, uh, Tulsa PD is running some test models with some first responders uh, as part of a team uh, or task force with mental health professionals on board with them. I I'm, I'm, uh, like to watch that, closely watch that and see how those kind of things work out. We deal with a lot, lot of mental, people with mental health issues. And... Uh, you know, as you probably remember, uh, and homeless, homeless is another big issue that's, that's come up over the last couple of years. So we've got to look for ways as a society to, to deal with these problems. If you'll remember, Mr. Callan, some years ago, there were mental health institutions and those people with problems were put in those institutions. Those institutions have all closed down. Probably a good thing in a way. The other, the other problem with that is what happens to those folks now those folks have become homeless. Um, they, don't, they don't have constant care and they go into mental health crisis. So we've got to look for ways to improve those situations. You know, I remember there was somebody on the corner in downtown Grove. I would drive by a few years ago and he was dancing and waving. Is that creating, I don't know who that was. He was an aspiring rap artist. Well, whatever he was, I mean, he was, he was, <laughs> <laughs> he looked so happy. He, looked he did. Better. Yeah, but he was just dancing and waving, and I thought, he's got a lot of free time on his hands, I guess. We, we, we got <laughs> dozens and dozens of calls on him, and, you know, they didn't like our response. It's not illegal to stand on the street corner and dance and be happy. You, you can do that Correct. all day, every day. It's fine. But, but that kind of uh, goes into part of the discussion. He was a black man. And uh, I do, I do uh, sincerely to believe that there wouldn't have been as many calls had that been a white guy dancing on the corner. Maybe there would have been because it's just kind of bizarre. But I, I do believe the fact that he was a black man created more concern in some people's um, in some people than if he had been a white guy. So I think that that did play into that. And I think, so we're, we're at about 12 o'clock right now. Uh, All right. Uh, Mr. Cowan, is there anything you want to uh, kind of give in closing? We could do this for the next six or seven hours and I could keep coming up with historical examples. We can all keep coming up with suggestions. Hopefully there's no need to hold a discussion on this a year or two from now, but we had to come up with a topic. I want to thank Mark Morris for taking an hour out of your time. And another great thing, I want to thank you, Jordan. The Zoom here seemed to work perfectly. I want to thank Riley Cisneros for participating, Barbara Turkle from Croatia, and everybody else. Thank you very much. And remember, oh, oh one closing comment. I often wish, uh, so this is Constitution Day. Um, Nobody, if you turned on the media this morning, unless I missed it, nobody said it was Constitution Day. It's easy to remember the 4th of July because it comes right in the middle of summer. I often wish the declaration was maybe in winter and give equal attention to Constitution Day. But I think you'd all say good luck on that one. The pattern is there. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you, uh, Mr. Morris. Thank you for having me. I, I enjoyed it and I'm available anytime you need something. Thank you. Hope to see you on the road here. Bye-bye.